you. Um, it's hard for me to believe that a month has gone by since the last time I was up here with you. Uh, so, yeah, time just is going fast. Doesn't matter whether we're quarantined or not, time is going fast. Well, before we start, I wanted to just make sure that you have a handout because the verses that I'm going to be reading this morning are from the handout. So if you don't have one, raise your hand and whoever has extras, ah, look at Miss, Miss Greta, Pastor Greta needs a handout. That wouldn't be good if she didn't have one. Okay, we'll go ahead and get started then. But I'm sure you're not surprised that today I am going to be talking again about that four letter acronym, PRAY, that talks about how we should pray with the elements of prayer so that we stay in balance, right? The P standing for pray, yeah, P standing for praise, the R for repent, the A for ask, and the Y for yield. And two months ago, I talked about ask. Last month, I talked about yield. So we're down to just 50 percent chance you could guess and get it right. But, <laughs> no, no, you're wrong. We're going to talk about the R today. We're going to talk about repent. And that's an interesting one because that is not a word that um, I think we're entirely clear on what it means, right? So I went to like the theologians when they talk about what does repent mean. I thought they would help me. But what they said is repent, repentance is godly sorrow. Okay, um, well, <laughs> what is that exactly? I'm not sure entirely. How is godly sorrow different from just regular sorrow? So that's not very helpful because it kind of raises more questions than it answers. But I think that the best way to understand the idea of godly sorrow is to find examples of it in scripture, even though if you look in a concordance, you're not gonna find anywhere where it says godly sorrow appears in 1 Thessalonians, whatever. You're not gonna find that, but we are gonna look at some passages in scripture just to see. But I think we better begin with prayer first, don't you? So on one side of the handout that you have there are some verses out of one of David's Psalms, Psalm 51, and just has some little background there. God, David meant for these words to be a prayer. They're good words for us to use today, because um, I think you would even find many of these familiar. So if you're able, I'd really love it if you would stand and bless God with me. We're going to read this out loud together. Okay, starting in verse 1. Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, I have sinned and have done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain me with a willing spirit. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. Amen. Okay, and I know that a lot of you did probably recognize those, at least some of those words. We sing some worship songs that pretty much say that verbatim, right? Create in me a clean heart. The Psalms were composed, all of the Psalms were composed as a way of sharing our hearts with God. And if you've ever tried to pray and you're not really sure what to pray, what to say, you know, you can certainly find a Psalm that would match the emotions that you're feeling because there are 150 Psalms and at least one of them is bound to be expressing the same emotion, the same thought that you are trying to, to express. Well, we're going to return to Psalm 51 later, but I really kind of want to start today with a discussion of repentance with Jesus' arrest and his crucifixion and the actions of two of his disciples, Judas and Peter. 
Now Judas, as we remember from the Gospels, Judas had sold Jesus out to the Jewish leaders. Remember that in the Gospels? He, he regretted it immediately, though, when you can see that in the Gospels. As we read in Matthew 27, verses 3 and 4, when Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was filled with remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders. I have sinned by betraying innocent blood, he said. So we learn that shortly afterwards, Judas commits suicide. In John's Gospel, we're told that Judas had been entered into by Satan, and that's in John chapter 13, verses 21 through 28. So at the moment that he betrayed Jesus, he was actually entered into by Satan. And Judas was also called the son of perdition in John 17, 12. The son of perdition means basically that he's condemned to die. He's eternally lost, spiritually <clears throat> lost. Well, Judas was sorry, right? He was sorry. He was even filled with remorse. But apparently that wasn't enough to save him. His sorrow was overwhelming. But it must not have been godly sorrow. If that were the case, though, you know, he must not have truly repented, right? Because godly sorrow, repentance, it's supposed to be the same thing. Well, we seem to be going around in circles. So I was confused myself when I thought about it at first. I thought, what? What is this all about? So let's see if we can understand this a little better. And I think we can do that by comparing what G G Judas did with Peter. Because Peter as we remember very well, denied Jesus not once, not twice, but three times. Just as Jesus had told him he would, he, he swore he wasn't going to do it, but he went ahead and did it. And when he realized what he had done, as Luke tells us in chapter 22 of his gospel, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter, and then Peter remembered the words that the Lord had spoken to him before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Well, after Jesus, or yeah, after Jesus' death, we learn in scripture that Peter returns to his old life as a fisherman. Remember that? He talks to the other disciples. He says, I'm going to go fishing. Well, the resurrection hasn't happened at that point. And it almost feels like Peter must really have lost hope. He's given up. He says, okay, I'm just going to go back to my old life. I'm going to fish. <laughs> well, didn't both Judas and Peter regret their betrayal of Jesus? Of course they did. We know that Judas was marked for perdition, and, and Peter was eventually restored. So I'm, I'm guessing that Peter must have done more than just gone outside and cry. He must have done more than that. Somehow he must have truly repented, right? But we still want to know, well, what does it mean to repent? The same thing as regret? Is, are they synonyms when you say repent? Does that mean regret? Well, that can't be right because it said that Judas was sorry. He was filled with remorse. He felt terrible. Just like Peter, they both felt terrible. They, they felt very sorry for what they had done. But that didn't seem to make any difference in their eternal destiny, did it? Well, let's look again at this psalm that we prayed together this morning, Psalm 51. We, we know that the Bible says that David was a man after God's own heart. We can see that in 1 Samuel 13, verse 14, and in Acts 13, 22. David is a man after God's own heart. But we have to remember that he was still an imperfect human being. He followed faithfully after God, right? For the most part, he was, he was really an outstanding. He wrote lots of good psalms. He did great things. He planned the temple. He did all kinds of wonderful things for God. And then all of a sudden, it's like he goes nuts, right? He, he loses it. He sees Bathsheba, and he decides he's going to have this affair with her while she's married, not just to anybody, but to one of his mighty men, one of his guys that really is loyal and faithful to him. So what's he do to cover it up when he finds out Bathsheba's going to have a baby? Uh-oh, this is no good. So he plots to have her husband murdered. Now, that's a man after God's own heart? <laughs> I don't know. It kind of gives you something to think about, right? He's broken at least four of the Ten Commandments, right? Because he, first he had to covet her. Then he stole her. He stole her away from her husband. 
he commits adultery with her, and he murders. So he's got four of them at least. You could probably come up with more out of the ten that he's managed to break all in one fell swoop. But what did David do when he realized the enormity of his sin? Finally, he does. He comes to his senses. He realizes this. Well, he certainly didn't kill himself like Judas did. But even more, like Peter, he didn't do that either. He could have done like Peter, right? Peter goes back to being a fisherman. Well, David could have said, eh, I'll give you up all this king stuff, you know, and repentance. I'm just going to give up being a king. I'm going to go back and be a sheep herder again. Well, he didn't do that either. So what David did was he confessed his sin. Now, if we look at the verses from Psalm 51, the heading of that, which I think I put on your handout, this is in scripture. This is not something added by a later editor. This is part of the scripture. It's introduced as a Psalm of David when the prophet Nathan came to him after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba. So we don't have to guess what it's about. Now, isn't that nice? So often in scripture, you're thinking, okay, what was that really about? What's the background here? Well, we get it with this one. So here's what David writes in verses 3 and 4. And you've already read this this morning. We prayed this. I know my wrongdoings, and my sin is constantly before me. Against you, you only, I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. So in other words, David is completely aware of his guilt and he makes no excuses for it. He's humble. And he's ready to accept whatever punishment God has decided that he deserves. Now we talked about yielding last time, remember, if you were here. And this is a good example of that. David has yielded. He has placed himself completely in God's hands. His sorrow, his remorse, they're from the depths of his heart. And he doesn't make his confession in private either. He doesn't go off into his prayer closet and do this. No, he writes a psalm, a psalm that ends up in the Bible with that heading. And everyone in every generation who reads that knows what is going on, right? It's a very public humbling of himself. It's a very public confession. So what we can look at is that what we see here is a, an example of godly sorrow. And I think another way that maybe makes that easier to understand is instead of godly, it's also God word, right? Like the word homeward means toward home. The word God word, W-A-R-D as a suffix means in the direction of. So God word sorrow means sorrow in the direction of God. And I think this is the key. He says that his sin is against God only. Now, this amazes me in a way. When I first read this, I thought, what? God only? You mean what you did to Bathsheba? What you did to her husband? What you did to everyone? Joab got sucked into the plot. One of his other commanders got sucked into his nasty plot. But it's really only against God that he sinned. Well, that's interesting because all that David can see is his fault before God. And what he's acknowledging is that it doesn't matter who else you might hurt in the process. Ultimately, every act of sin is a rebellion against God. And so your sin ultimately is against God even more than it's against other people. Now, recognizing this, David is just devastated by this. That's just devastating. But this is the key to the whole thing. So if we look again at Peter, I've left him hanging. But we're going to come back to him now. We read in chapter 21 that Peter and some of the other disciples had decided they were, they were going to go back to fishing again. And I'm thinking, it doesn't say, but I'm supposing that this might be how they dealt with their grief and their shame over Jesus' death and the, the cowardice that they showed at that crucial moment when they could have stuck up for Jesus. Instead, they all abandoned him and they ran off. They're filled with grief and shame, but this is how they might deal with it. And I think I can totally relate to that because I know that when I've done something wrong and I can't do anything to fix it, you know, I don't want to just sit around and feel terrible about that. You know, I, I throw myself into some activity and the activity is, no, it's not fun. It's not distracting. No, no. I find the most unpleasant 
thing to do, but I do it, you know, because that's, that's how I deal with feeling really terrible. So I might clean the bathroom or I might do my taxes or some, you know, task I really don't like doing because that helps me feel like I still have some value. I still have a purpose for even being alive. And I don't know if any of the rest of you have ever done that, but that's that I can relate to what these guys are doing here. Well, Peter's grief and remorse, they're, they're just kind of beyond words though. You know, he's not, a, he's not, he's a man that talks a lot, you might notice, but he's not a really deep guy for the most part. I mean, he was no David. He couldn't compose a song or pour out his heart in words like David would do. We don't even know exactly what he was thinking or feeling because the scripture doesn't provide that a time that he's confessed uh, to his sin, at least not in words. And I wonder if he's remembering Jesus's words at the last Passover. And we think in Matthew, or I'm sorry, in Mark 14, this is how Mark describes it. When it was evening, Jesus came with the twelve. As they were reclining at the table and eating, Jesus said, Truly I say to you that one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. And they began to be grieved and say to him one by one, Surely not I. And he said to he, Jesus, said to them, It is one of the twelve, one who dips with me in the bowl. For the Son of Man is to go, just as is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had never been born. Whoa. So today we know that that scripture, what Jesus is saying here, he's actually referring to Judas, right? We all know that. But at the time, when Peter is, you know, has betrayed Jesus, denied him three times, wept bitter tears. Jesus is crucified and dead and in the tomb. At that time, maybe Peter might have thought that Jesus was referring to him. Did, Jesus, did Peter think that he was going to be lost for eternity? Did he think it would have been better if he'd never been born? I mean, can you just imagine how broken Peter would have felt? He loved Jesus. And I can't even imagine, it, but all I do know is that it was he was probably broken beyond words. There, there was no way he could make a confession because he just didn't even have the words to say. But the Apostle Paul writes in his letter to Romans, to the Romans, um, first, or chapter 8, verse 26. And this is a really famous verse. I think you all have heard it. The Spirit also helps in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we should. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Now, doesn't that describe Peter? And he wouldn't, of course, have seen this verse at that time, but that's exactly the kind of thing that he would have needed to read. But, hey, you know, Jesus didn't abandon him. He never does. Because Jesus knew Peter's heart. And he responds. Jesus will always respond to our heart's cry. And we often say that Jesus meets us where we are, and I think this is a wonderful example that we're about to look at. Peter's trying to make himself feel better, I guess, or, or whatever, by catching fish. And, of course, the, the gospel says that he and the others went fishing, but John 21, 3 says that he and the others, they caught nothing all night long. Well, that must have just put the icing on the cake, huh? I mean, he can't even be a success at being a fisherman. Not only does he, de he deny his Messiah, he can't even go back to his own vocation and, and catch any fish. Nothing's working for the poor guy. And he's wondering probably, is this a sign? Am I totally lost? Everything I try to do from now on is going to be a failure? So at daybreak, Jesus shows up on the shore, and it's recorded in verse 6 of John's chapter that um, Jesus tells them, cast the net on the right-hand side of the boat, and you will find the fish. So they catch the net, and they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. So what is Jesus saying there? He's blessing them, basically, right? He's saying... I'm going to make sure that you get your fish. You went out to fish. Here's some fish. That's pretty neat. 
that Peter understands that this must be Jesus, even though he's a stranger. They don't know, you know, for sure. But Peter just says, oh, this has got to be Jesus. Well, who else could it be that would do such a thing? And even though the boat isn't far from shore, we read that in the scripture, the boat's not far from shore, he can't wait. Now, isn't that just like Peter? He can't wait. So he jumps into the water. Now, I want to make a point here, by the way, that in that time, um, the Jewish people did not look at swimming the way maybe we do. They didn't do it for recreation or anything like that, especially the ocean. They were afraid of the ocean. It was dark. It had weird creatures in it. They didn't jump into the water just, you know, for fun. So for him, jumping into that water, instead of waiting for the boat to come to shore, I look at that as an act of humility. What he's basically saying is, I am yielding my whole self to you, and whatever's in the water that might get me, I don't care. You know, I, I am going to come towards you. So what is Peter doing? He's got a God word, sorrow. He's moving toward God. So in, in imagining the scene, actually, I was reminded of the, the prodigal son, the parable of the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15. You might want to look that up. And it was like the penitent son. Remember, he's sorry that he's out with the pigs and he's saying, I should just go home to my dad because I had it better there and I'm just a terrible son, but I'm just going to beg him to take me back. So like that son, Peter is drawn back to the one that he had wronged. But like the father in the parable, Jesus accepts Peter without rebuke. So, you know, maybe Peter would have even been reminded of that parable. We don't know. But he had heard it. Jesus had said it at least once. He told that story. And just as Peter was applying himself to something useful in trying to catch fish, Jesus was busy too. He was cooking breakfast for everybody. So Peter was doing an action. Well, Jesus is doing an action. So Peter had no words for his grief and his pain. And Jesus meets his brokenness by expressing love and forgiveness, not in words, but in actions, by offering up the fish for, and telling everybody, come on and eat, breakfast is ready. Now that's a peace offering if I ever heard one. It's probably the greatest peace offering in history when you think about it. And what we see in John's account is repentance and restoration. And it might look simple on the surface, right? It might look like a simple interchange, but it's really pretty profound. As Peter is healed, and this is, this is the point you need to remember, Peter was healed because he first was broken. You can't be healed of something that you don't have, right? If I don't have cancer, you can't heal me of cancer. And if he isn't broken by his sin, he cannot be healed. So let's think about Judas, though. Let's get back to him for just a second, because he may have been broken. I'm not going to say he wasn't broken. It sounds to me, when I read that account, he was truly remorseful. He was filled with regret for what he had done. But here's the key. He did not return to God for his healing. He didn't move toward God, right? So he did not have a godly sorrow, a God-word sorrow. He tried to escape from God, in fact, by committing suicide, whatever. He took matters into his own hands. He did not go back to, to God. Now, I'm sure that you can see that this would work the same way for each of us. Because true repentance hurts. And it breaks us. As Proverbs chapter 18, verse 14 states, A crushed spirit, who can bear but repentance is not about outward show. It's not about weeping and wailing and you know, the, the monks that wore the hair shirts and all that stuff. Yeah, that's a, it's a big to-do, right? But that isn't what it's all about. It's not about having a long face and looking miserable. Only God knows our hearts. And that'll be a real help for those of you who are not particularly emotional. I mean, I don't tend to be really emotional, but that doesn't mean my heart doesn't feel things. I just don't necessarily express them. And anyone who's like that should feel pretty cheered by that because God knows what's in your heart. And if you're truly repentant, if you're truly broken, God will 
respond to that. Now, as 1 John 1, 9 promises, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We'll understand that confession is part of repentance. It is also a moving toward God. It's the part with your, you put your brokenness into words. So that is part of it. And the other part of it, of course, is your actions, your behavior. How do you how do you change your behavior, your attitude, the things you do, your plans for the future? That's what repentance looks like. It's the way to healing and restoration. As the Psalm says, a broken and a contrite spirit, God will not despise. So we're now return, entering into a time of communion. It just makes this the perfect sermon for today because we're entering into a time of communion. And I do want to just caution you. I'm not saying that we're all supposed to wear hair shirts and be miserable about communion. Communion is a time of joy and a time of celebration, but it's also a time for reflection where we think about things that maybe we haven't really been honest with ourselves and honest with God about. And we can, we can talk to him now. And as Pastor Greta is going to come up and lead us in the communion service, so take time to reflect. And maybe you have something specific you want to confess, and maybe you don't. But remember, though, that communion, like repentance, is a way of moving toward God. So Pastor Greta, come on up.